evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's service. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Amen. Our pianists were playing and the, the orchestra as well, so we're so thankful for, the, for those burdens that are lifted and our sins completely washed away. Amen. By Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right, let's start off the service tonight with a chorus. This is a traditional one that I know well, and I know you know it as well. Uh, 520, I just keep trusting my Lord. We can trust in him no matter what the, the situation of life. We can place our faith and our complete trust in him. We know that he'll lead, guide, and direct all the way. 520, if you'll stand with me, please. We'll sing this and then another congregation or two. Five, 520, join me, please. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and He gives a song. And though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never, never fail. On the first stanza. 
there's coming a day that we no clouds up there will there jesus christ will be the light amen? amen yes he will all right thank you lady that was very nicely done praise god 339 you can remain seated we'll sing one more congregation and then faith is going to come and share a special right why not <laughs> 339 under his wings i am safely abiding We'll sing all three stanzas. If you have your songbook, you can join in. Under his wings I am safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild Still I can trust him I know he will keep me He has redeemed me and I situation is in, in our lives that we face every day. God is with us every step of the way. Uh, Faith is going to come now and share that special. By 
your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you've made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood has washed away my sin jesus thank you the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table jesus thank you Pray that all of us in our own heart, while she sang that song, was saying ourselves, maybe not singing it, but saying, Jesus, thank you for saving me and for redemption's plan. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn with me together to Malachi chapter number one as we take a few moments here in this book and we will partake of the Lord's Supper tonight in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter number one. Malachi was a prophet. Uh, prophets, prophets were not born prophets. Priests were born priests. If you were of a certain lineage after Aaron, then your birth could make you a priest. No one was born a prophet. God selected these men. They were called. And Malachi prophesied about a hundred years after Nehemiah. So if you, if you have been with us on Wednesday nights, you remember that Nehemiah was a uh, burden of the Lord to return back to his homeland and rebuild the walls. And there was a tremendous revival in, in the nation because a revival of, of just the goodness of the Lord. And God's brought us back and he's kept his promise and, and uh, a terrific swelling of spiritual uh, of spiritual renewal is seen in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, well, Malachi is about a hundred years after that. And so a hundred years after that great time of revival, things are bad again. And it's just a, a good reminder for us that it doesn't take many years for things to change. And even in our country, I've sensed a tremendous shift in the last decade or two. It doesn't take long. A hundred years may seem like a long time, but really in the scope of things, the nation had sort of changed 180 from what we read in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, and Malachi is burdened. As the prophet of God, he's burdened. He's burdened with a message from God for the people. And the message that he has from the Lord for the nation 
is partly directed because God knows what's happening in the country. God knows what's happening in the heart of the people. And I also wanted to say that I believe Malachi knew what was happening. Uh, his ear was to the ground, so to speak. He would be with the people and mingle with the people and be there with uh, the nation. And he knew what was happening. His, he, he was not dumb or deaf to the, uh, to the circumstances and the conditions around him. And so the Bible says in verse 1 that it's the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And I think we should consider that burden. He was burdened for his nation. Uh, and I've sort of waffled back and forth. I'm not waffled, but it's been difficult for me on how, how much of an emphasis should we put on America. Uh, it's a good thing to be burdened for our country. It's a good thing to be burdened for our country. I never want to become apathetic toward America. I heard someone say not long ago, they said, well, America's not in prophecy, so who cares? This is still my country, and I love her. And I want her to be right and do right. And um, so Malachi was burdened with a word from the Lord, uh, and things had changed in his country. And he had uh, a message, a strong message from God to tell. And if you'll allow me tonight, and if you'll follow along, uh, I just want to sort of, I, I want to give a few highlights of this message that Malachi had for the people, and I, I pray that this will lead right into our time of communion and the Lord's Supper. Uh, he was witness to a nation <clears throat> that was struggling to believe that God loved them. Would you consider that for a moment? The nation of Israel was struggling to believe that God loved them. Look at verse number two of chapter number one. The message is, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. I want to ask you tonight, when is it most, what time is the most susceptible time for someone to doubt whether God loves them? I, I didn't plan on really asking for an answer, but somebody share with me tonight, what do you think is the most susceptible time for someone to doubt that God loves them? Brother Lyndon? Good point. Praise the Lord. Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir, Pat. Sickness. That's right. That's good. Elijah. When you're in distress. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, really, we've, we've sort of, I think in the four answers we've gotten, it's really just sort of two that overlap. It's when you are apathetically in sin or when you are in distress or difficulty. Those are the two times when someone is most susceptible to doubting the love of God. And so what was it for Israel? What was their time? Well, it was both. They were apathetic, and they were following a pattern of sin. But also look at verse number 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation Forever, And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Suffice to say, times were tough in Israel. You don't just sort of restart a nation like that and it flourish. <clears throat> Things had been hard. 
Things had been hard for them to reestablish. Things had been hard for them to, to govern. They were still under Persian rule for a long time after they reconstituted themselves as a nation. And they were paying heavy taxes and heavy tribute. And what we read in verse number 4 is them referencing Esau and Edom. So let me just give a, a, a little uh, example here very quickly. Things were hard for Israel... And they're saying, yeah, but Edom, things be, seem to be going real good for them. They're rising up, they're building, they're flourishing, they're going, and we're not. They're having great times, and we're not. And didn't God say that he loved Jacob and hated Esau, and the Edomites are the descendants of Esau? So what gives? I thought God loved us. I thought God cared for us. And here we are impoverished and here we are struggling. Everything in life is a struggle and we are not receiving the blessings we expect. And therefore, you will doubt the love of God. It's not a, 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 a one... This is a, this is a common theme through the Bible. Um, can we all hold our place here and go back to Psalm 73? Real quickly, tonight, Psalm 73. Many of you know this psalm. This is a powerful psalm. If you have the time and would make the time to study this, this will really help you and be a blessing to you. It's a psalm of Asaph. And it starts off, verse number one, saying, Truly God is good to Israel. Well, that's a right statement, right? Truly God is good to Israel, even as such a, as of a clean heart. But what's the next four words of verse two? But as for me, you know, he loves everybody but, but me. He's really good to everybody but me. My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength uh, is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And, and, there is, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. And wash my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against this, the, the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful to me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou canst. Uh, castest them down unto, unto destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakeneth. So, O Lord, when thou awakeneth, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was picked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in the heavens but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I, that I desire but thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring after thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It's a great lesson from a man who said, I almost slipped up. I almost slipped up by looking at all of the 
seemingly good sides of everybody else and the bad things that I endure. Oh, they're married, but I'm not married. They have a house, I'm still renting. No, oh, they, they're, they've had their job for 30 years and I've been laid off five times. Well, their, their health is uh, pretty good and every time I go to the doctor, it's another medicine. And we begin to say, well, look at everybody else having everything so wonderful. But me, I suffer. But me, it's so bad. And I'm saying this to us in a, in a very uh, 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 a, a patient way, but a very serious way. When we begin to see the prosperity of others and begin to see the seemingly problems in our own life, it won't be long till you'll start to doubt the love of God. And that's a bad place to be. At least Asaph came around and said, I almost slipped. But when I went to the house of the Lord, I realized how foolish was I. How foolish was I to think that way? Well, quickly, secondly, in the book of Malachi, not only did Malachi have to address the fact that the nation felt unloved because all the other nations seemed more prosperous than they, but also, number two, the missed blessing of offering God less than our best. The missed blessing of of offering God less than our best. Verse number six, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If, this is Malachi chapter number one, uh, uh, church family, and if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us, this hath been by your means. Will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts? The misblessing of offering God less than our best. <clears throat> this morning we alluded to the sacrificial system that God had put in place and the ordinances and the laws that he spoke through Moses. And one of the reasons why all of that was put in place, it's called a covenant. The Old Testament is Old Covenant. And the New Testament is New Covenant. And do you, know what the res or do you know what the end result of any covenant with God is? Your blessing. Any covenant with God results on the blessing for the Christian, for the believer. And all that was put in place in the Old Testament was not for the, the crushing of the, of, the, of the individual. It was for the blessing of the individual to offer the bread, to give the sacrifice, to commune with God, to say your prayers, to, to come to the house of God, to, to, to worship the Lord, to, to, uh, to, to give to the Lord. All of that was designed to be the blessing for the individual. And they had fallen into a, a, a place where they were offering God polluted bread. They were offering God blind animals. They were offering God lame animals. And they were offering God sick animals. And the question is, is that all they had? No, sir. They had better. They had better. But they kept the good bread for themselves. They kept the healthy animals for themselves. They kept the best of their herds for themselves, thinking that was the way of blessing. Thinking that was the way of fulfillment. But you and I know tonight, on a Sunday evening, as we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper... God wants to commune with us. God wants to visit with us. And the offering of these things to the Lord was the pathway of blessing. But they had deceived themselves into thinking that if I offer God less, I'll be better for it. If I offer God worse, I will be better for it. If I offer God little, 
I will be further ahead. And the truth is, you never are. You never are. The bread mentioned in verse 7, the polluted bread, was probably a reference to the meal offering. And I was thinking as I was putting uh, this brief message together tonight, um, uh, my wife does a wonderful job making meals to send to people and give them away. And that's not an unusual thing to go into the house and see the kitchen just a flurry of, of preparation for meals to take to someone or several people. And uh, not long ago, she took some chicken pot pies to people. And I don't know, there must have been 10, 12, 15 pot pies all over the house. Every place where you could find a flat space, we put a pot pie uh, there in the house. <clears throat> and not every chicken pot pie comes out the best. Some are less perfect than others. I'm trying to be careful here tonight. Some are not as good as others. Some don't look as nice as the others, right? But I know my wife, she gives the best ones away. She gives the best ones away. Because there's a joy in her heart to give the best ones away. And I know I'm talking to most of you tonight would, would say the same thing. The greatest joy is giving the best one away. That's the best feeling. That's when you feel, if, if, if your heart is such that you want to keep the best for you, and you want to keep the most expensive one for yourself, and you want to keep the nicest one for you, then something's wrong spiritually in your heart. There's the joy of giving the best away. And somehow this nation had convinced themselves that if I keep the best for me, I'll be better off. And they weren't. And they weren't. But lastly here, they had fallen prey to the weary weariness of doing right. In chapter number 1, verse number uh, 10, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it. Uh, in that ye say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness is it. But would you just consider that phrase for a moment tonight? What a weariness is it. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hands, saith the Lord? I guess when I read chapter 1 of Malachi, I've read it many, many times. I was more brokenhearted this time than I was a little uh, angry or, or more aggressive. Uh, this chapter could be preached or taught with a little bit more of a, of a, of a, of a, a cutting tone. Like, how dare they offer these things? How dare they offer this kind? How dare, they, uh, how dare they do this? How dare they feel that God doesn't love them? But when I read it several times, thinking about tonight, I feel more sorry. I feel sorry that they had missed the love of God. I feel sorry that they had been deceived themselves into thinking keeping the best for them is, is the pathway of fulfillment. And I feel bad that they became weary doing the right thing. The Bible says that we should not become weary in well-doing. Many of you know that scripture. But it is a very valid uh, temptation, maybe is in the word. It's a very valid uh, possibility that we can become weary in well-doing. Weary. The phrase snuffed at, that was an interesting phrase, snuffed at, and this is what I found in my, in my, uh, in my study. A snuffing at it is a metaphor of what cattle do when they don't like their food. They blow strongly through the nostrils. <laughs> you know, like, pfft. you know, it's time to go offer a sacrifice, you know, it's time to go up to the temple again. Oh, it's, it's time for us to say a prayer. 
How about reading some Bible? And I know we, but that's where they were. Eh, just tired of it. Over and over and over and over again, I'm just so tired of it. Why? Why are we doing this? The whole thing's polluted anyways. It doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing all this? And for once, maybe the first time in my life, I feel sorry for the nation that they became weary. And they remained in that weariness for 400 years. After Malachi, there's nothing more, no more revivals, no more rise of spiritual, no more word from the Lord. It's really 400 years of just silence, and it's 400 years of a nation that is doubting the love of God, a nation that is keeping the best for themselves, and a nation that is weary and snuffing at anything that belongs to the Lord. Until Jesus comes. The arrival of Jesus Christ changes things. The shepherds rejoiced and Mary rejoiced and Elizabeth rejoiced and the wise men rejoiced and John the Baptist rejoiced and he was sent to prepare the way because things are changing. Amen? Things are changing. Jesus is here. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the news. I've talked to some people about it. There's a ship stuck in the Suez Canal. Stuck. Stuck fast, stuck hard. They say that strong winds, of course, they're piling these ships. I think it was, this is one of the largest container ships in the world, uh, uh, commissioned in 2018. They're making ships larger and larger and taller and taller and longer and bigger. Uh, this thing is larger than the Eiffel, longer than the Eiffel Tower if it's too straight. And the container stacked up on this thing for, I don't know, it seems like 25 tall of those uh, uh, semi-truck containers. And I guess this, this uh, ship was making its way through the Suez Canal, and, and they say that the winds were high, and, and that ship was supposed to go straight through that canal, just sort of went sideways, and, you know? I mean, you can't really, you know, back and forth, you know, <laughs> zigzag out, of, you just sort of stuck right in the, in the muck and the mud, and there it is, with hundreds and hundreds of ships not able to pass through not able to pass through because of one. Just one. Someone said this morning, they said, uh, that's God blowing on the ship and, and causing a, a, who knows? It could be the chastised judgment of the Lord. We don't know. But here's this ship stuck in the Suez Canal and everything around it just in a holding pattern. Some have been diverted because billions of dollars are at stake as far as economies go. And so some are deciding, well, we've got to go around the Horn of Africa. So let's just start now. Let's take our uh, eight to ten days, our extra time going around. And others are still waiting. But everything's clogged up. Everything is held up. All of Europe is sort of in a panic because of one ship that went <laughs> stuck in the mud. And I don't, I don't want to make this too, too light tonight or, or, or lower the metaphor too much. But this little thing of being weary with God and being wearied with the things of the Lord, that'll mess up everything in your life. It'll mess up everything. Because you could do the right thing in weariness, and it really has no, it won't matter anyways. It's like the, the Jews of this day were still offering sacrifices, but it was like, why, what is this? They were still holding fasts. Everybody's got a fast. We're going to all fast for a week. Yeah, but why are we doing this? All right, I just, oh, okay. They were still tithing, the Pharisees, tithing of their mint and their annies and their cumin. These little tiny spices, 10% for the Lord's work and 90% for my work. They were still doing the little tiny mint, just a little bit of mint for the Lord. But all in weariness, all in weariness. And it was empty and vain and just ate them from the inside. Tonight we're going to observe the Lord's table. And the reason why I was sort of brought to this point is because let's not do this in weariness tonight. Because it is a valid 
it's a, it's a serious caution tonight that there are times when we can come to church and our Bibles are open and Pastor Matt's going to read a chapter in the book of Matthew about the crucifixion of our Lord. It's just a quarter till. He's going to read a chapter for us. There, are, there, there, there is a very real potential for a Christian to say, okay, read it fast. Let's get this communion thing over with. It's almost an hour. I mean, it's been a little bit long tonight. And I, I don't think that's the most part of our church. I think it's very, if, if, if it's present, it's a small part. But I want us all to be on guard of becoming weary. Ah, again. It's, 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 it's again. Here, we have to do it again. Another offering. A, another. They want us to come to another Bible study. Let's not become weary in well-doing. Not become weary in our walk and our time with the Lord. Because what we're going to do tonight, partake of these elements, this is very precious. It's very precious. As we remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom all those Old Testament sacrifices were a picture and a figure and a shadow for. I'm going to ask Pastor Matt to come and read uh, for us the chapter that's been selected if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 27, this is what he'll be reading tonight, 66 verses in that chapter as we think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 27. I went to the, I hear the rustling of pages come to an end. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See that thou, see thou to that. He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for us to put them into the treasury because, the, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, and the Lord, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? He answered him to ne never a word, inasmuch as the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they, should, whom they would. And when, they had a and when they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas, therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Will ye that I release unto you Barabbas? or Jesus, which is called the Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he was set down in the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail nothing, 
but that rather the tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole hot band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they had played a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to, be cru to crucify him. As they came out, they found the man of Cyrene, Simeon, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And there were two thieves crucified with him, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him know. Now come down from the cross, and we will believe on him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. These also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard it said, This man calleth for Elias. And straight one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, that they, the, and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women there beheld him, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, the mother of Zebedee's children. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priest and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, 
After three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pot said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way. Make it sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. We'd like to sing a song just a cappella tonight. It's page number 53, and this is an invitation for you. If you want to pray, use the altars tonight um, as we uh, sing this song. It's page number 53. Many of you know it uh, already. Uh, but let's sing it just the voices tonight, a cappella on page number 53. Will you join me in singing tonight? And use the altars and pray. Bow your heads and pray where you are. If you want to talk to the Lord, the rest of us will sing. But let's sing together. When I survey the Thank you for allowing us to partake in this that we will do now in these few moments that remain. Thank you for the privilege of it, the reminder of it, the effect of it, the power of it, uh, the necessity of it. 
the help that it brings to our heart. And Lord, uh, life is such, we regrettably say that life sometimes grabs us and it's sad to say we do have times where we forget. And please forgive us, dear Lord, for forgetting what great sacrifice was paid for our redemption. Tonight, may this reminder accomplish that which you've intended it for, for what you've commanded it for. And thank you for the privilege of being able to do this with my brothers and sisters and my family uh, tonight, this time of remembrance and Lord's Supper. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The music will play softly tonight for the remainder of the service, and, and uh, we'll serve both elements uh, this evening, and we ask you to be patient as we will serve both, and we'll partake of them both after both have been served. Uh, we'll partake together in unison. Uh, anyone that wishes to be served can be served. We will not refuse it to anyone. Parents, it's really up to you for your children on whether they can partake in this time of communion tonight. The Bible is clear that this is uh, certainly to be done by those who have faith in Jesus Christ, who have been born again. Else, what is the remembrance for you if you don't know the Lord? And then obedience is required, not perfection. There's not one perfect person in this room tonight. But obedience is required. And if there are things in your heart that aren't quite right with the Lord, settle it now before we partake. The music as it plays softly, you'll have time to pray. Eyes will be closed. Christians will be praying, talking to the Lord. It's good for us to have a tactical. It's good for us to hold those things in our hands. And then to have those elements touch our tongue and our lips because we're really using all of our senses to remember that Jesus died for us and shed his blood for us. And this is our time of remembering. No, no one has a picture of Jesus. All we have is this, to remember what he's done for us tonight. So I'll, I'll ask uh, Faith to begin to play quietly, and then our, our uh, deacons, if they would come and, and take a, a spot here on the front row so we can begin to serve.
Pastor Roy, would you come please and offer a prayer for us tonight on behalf of these elements and we'll partake of them together. The Bible says that when Jesus instituted this with his disciples, he gave thanks for each element. And when you just take a moment to consider that Jesus knew what the bread represented and he knew what the cup represented and he gave thanks for them both. And uh, so we will give thanks as well tonight. And um, Mr. Roy, would you please give thanks for the uh, broken body of our Lord first and then we'll partake of them uh, for the cup tonight. Father, indeed, we come here with tremendous gratitude for your tremendous love for us in that we were sinners without hope and there was only one hope for us that a man would be able to fulfill your law in perfection and to die the death for sin and you Lord the sinful sinless one came and presented yourself in a body a human body and that body Lord was broken for us and endured the eternal wrath of God uh, Lord and you did this that you would take the sins of all of the world upon yourself and upon that body and for that we thank you for that and we remember what you have done in this uh, partaking of the element here at the Lord's table we love you and we thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus Christ Before we offer a prayer tonight thanking the Lord Jesus for his blood that was shed, just a reminder tonight that that blood had to be placed somewhere. And Jesus did not go into the Holy of Holies on earth to place that blood. That would have had no value. He placed his blood in heaven at the mercy seat before the Father. And I am particularly thankful tonight that his perfect blood was accepted. Uh, uh, on behalf of our sins and, and for the remission of our sins. So Pastor Orr will offer a prayer and thank God for the blood tonight. Indeed, again, we, uh, in remembrance, look back at the time that you endured the many stripes uh, that were laid upon you and the thorny crown that was uh, pressed into your brow and the stakes that went through your hand, all breaking flesh, and drawing blood and that blood was going to be the eternal uh, atonement for sins it is by your blood that sin is washed away and that souls are made free and indeed that uh, what that uh, blood was not taken into a place that perishes but a place uh, where the eternal remembrance of God will be ever upon it on that eternal mercy seat mm -hmm. and we'll never ever have to doubt whether or not we if we've placed our trust in you have eternal salvation for that precious blood of God that was shed on our behalf we thank you for this honor and opportunity to partake in uh, the uh, blood atonement by this element here thank you so much Lord Jesus The Bible says that when Jesus had finished that meal with his men, that they sang a hymn before he went out into the Mount of Olives. And uh, that's become a tradition for us and for many Christians that after we partake, we sing a hymn together uh, and rejoice. So, uh, Brother Pat, would you come and introduce a song for us so we can sing together? We'll sing stanza number one of hymn number one, My Savior's Love. Would you stand? We'll be dismissed after this, Pastor. Okay, we'll be dismissed after this stanza. Hymn number one. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Number one. Now. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You're just